Hi, welcome back to Test Those Breasts podcast. I'm Jamie Vaughn. Today, my guest is Catherine Bunker. Catherine is a certified lymphedema therapist and has been a physical therapist for about 10 years. She attended the University of California, Davis for her bachelor's in exercise biology, as well as psychology and Mount St. Mary's College for her doctorate in physical therapy. While Catherine obtained her CLT two years ago, she consistently pursues ongoing education in oncology and lymphedema management. Last year, she obtained her advanced lymphedema certification and is excited to learn as much as she can when it comes to the latest information regarding lymphedema. Well, welcome, Catherine. I'm so glad that you're here. I just met you when I decided to go to a class here in Reno at Renown to find out more about lymphedema. And boy, did I learn so much more than I had expected because when I was in New Orleans getting my surgery done, there is a specialist in the hospital who taught me a lot, told me what it was. And, but of course, my mind was all over the place at that time. And there are so many people who don't know what lymphedema is. And I'm so glad that you're here because we want to know more about what it is. What the heck is lymphedema and how does it affect your body? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And that's a great question. And it's a question I get regularly, every single day, many times a day. I don't even know why I'm here. What is lymphedema? And so I think the best way to explain it is it's just an abnormal accumulation of water and protein in your body and mostly in those more superficial cell spaces. So if you think of your body as, or at least the lymphatic system, as like a body suit that's covering you. You have superficial lymphatics that are just a millimeter under the skin. And then you have deeper lymphatics that are within the muscles and joints. And, and then you have lymph nodes in there as well. So their job is to pull fluid from the bloodstream to filter those larger cells that are too big to go through the capillaries. So protein, waste products, bacteria, all of that is pulled out by the lymphatic system and brought up into the lymph nodes to be filtered. And that way it can be broken down and then ultimately returned back to circulation. So that's a normal process. And the body is very efficient. It filters two to four liters of fluid every single day. And what can happen though, especially with people who've had breast cancer treatment, is we interrupt the system. So the most common cause of lymphedema in the United States is treatment from breast cancer. And the reason is, for one, usually you're having a lymph node removal. So whether it's one lymph node removed or all of them removed, your risk is present. And the reason is because we've affected the capacity for filtration. So if you were functioning at this level before, now you're down here. But the problem is you don't really know what your capacity is. And that's why prevention is key is because I also don't know what your city is. And so we have to make sure that you don't get a backup of that protein-rich fluid because that is what makes it so persistent and so challenging once you do develop it. It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you learn so much about your body when you get breast cancer. You learn so much about how your body works. And who knew just by getting a couple of those out that you would be at such risk. And it's not something that is just a little thing like this could get really bad if you don't prevent it. And then, of course, if you do get it, you can't reverse it. Is that right? Is that what I heard? Correct. So if you do develop true lymphedema, then it is could be progressive if you don't manage it. So essentially, if you develop lymphedema and you're able to catch it in the early stages, it's a disease that requires management. That's not to say, I think what happens when people hear about lymphedema is they Google. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, I want people to do as much research as possible. The problem with Google, though, is you get images of extreme yes. versions of lymphedema. Oh my gosh, I know. I did it. I did it. And let me tell you something, Catherine, when I first got breast cancer, 
I had a friend of mine who gave me some advice. She said, the one piece of advice I'm going to give to you is don't Google stuff. Don't <laughs> Google. You will go down a rabbit hole. And I decided to go ahead and Google it. And I saw some of the images and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I can't do that. I need to not get that. So thank you for saying that because I really do think that a lot of people do go down that Google rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, I think talking to people like you or people who've had lymphedema. So because the reason I actually reached out to you because I wasn't originally going to because I thought, oh, I already saw a lymphedema person in New Orleans and she did teach me a lot, although some of it went over my head because again, mm -hmm. I was in a whirlwind of, oh my God, just about to get a mastectomy and stuff like that. And I decided to go to you because I just wanted to hear more because my friend reached out to me who had breast cancer, I think about, I don't know, six years ago. And she says, hey, watch out for lymphedema. And she says, I actually got lymphedema. I think it was like three years after she was cancer free. She didn't know anything about it. I don't think she had any kind of education on it. She's here in our city. And she said, so now she has to pump her arm every day with this sleeve and things like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to class. And I was going to originally go virtually. And then I'm like, nah, I need to meet this Catherine because one of my mm -hmm. other friends said, you need to meet this Catherine. So I'm so mm -hmm. glad that I did. So do you have anything else to add to that? First Absolutely. Of all? I have tons of things to add. Anytime. You do have tons of things and <laughs> you have tons of resources too. <laughs> yes. So... I guess to follow up with your point, Google images will show you extreme cases of lymphedema. And our goal with you, even the goal of your podcast here is to not even get to that stage. That's an extreme stage. And okay. I think when people see that, they see huge limbs. And usually I think on Google, it's like a leg or yeah, that tends to be in third world countries. Um, it's from like the, yeah, it's a parasite actually called filariasis. Okay. So very extreme. <laughs> we shouldn't see that here in America. And when we're talking about breast cancer and we're talking about lymphedema that develops because of breast cancer, it traditionally, and we can never say this is how it is all the time and this is how it's not. So I have to talk in generalities, but there are exceptions to everything. So traditionally, lymphedema is a slow grow and you're not going to wake up tomorrow with a Hulk arm. It's, you're not going to win. <laughs> okay. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, like, what is that? <laughs> well, and for one, the lymphatic system is a one-way system. So if you think about, and if you've had an axillary node dissection, you should have a scar right in that axillary area. So okay. that's where they took the node. And because it's a one-way system, you can think of that location as a car accident. So you have the car accident site, and then the way lymphedema works is the fluid buildup is like a backup of traffic. The difficult thing about it is I don't know where the backup will happen for everybody. So traditionally, yes, we see it in the arm. That is where everyone looks. That is, I think, the most quantity of patients I see. It's in the arm. But you can also see lymphedema in the breast or in the side of the chest or even in the back. And it's because your axillary lymph nodes are collecting fluid from what we call that upper quadrant. And so little <laughs> brief lesson in anatomy. Learning is going to be off the chart today with more new information. But if you kind of slice your body in half and then section it side to side to right and left side, and then if you go below your collarbone, down to your belly button, and then to the bottom of the rib cage, to the spine, and then up to that really bumpy part of your shoulder blade, plus your arm, all of that is draining into your axillary lymph nodes. So that's why we could see lymphedema anywhere in the quadrant. It's less common to see it everywhere. So your whole side shouldn't all of a sudden just blow up and be large. But you have to be mindful of that space. And so when we talk about prevention and we're talking about things to look out for, I don't want you just to look at your hands every day or your fingers every day because for one, your fingers are at the end of the chain. 
So if you see swelling in your fingers, you more than likely have swelling closer to where they took those notes. In addition, you could see swelling starting in the breast. I get patients who come in and they're like, that's really weird. Like, the breast feels heavy and there's, it's kind of firm. And when I take a look at it, it is. And it's because as lymphatic fluid sits, especially in the breast, it firms up because of that protein component. And so very superficially, when you feel your skin, it's like, oh, it's, it's kind of hard, but it's not lumpy. So for those people who have palpated lumps on themselves, the texture is different. It, and it's just because those lymphatics are sitting a millimeter under the skin. So when we're talking about prevention, we're talking about watching the quadrant. So very common things that hopefully most people have heard already is that's why you want to avoid blood draws and punctures and injections on that side because you don't want to risk any sort of infection coming into the area because like we talked about before, your capacity was over here, but now that you're missing some lymph nodes, it's lower. So if you get an infection in the arm, you could have that surge of inflammation and all of a sudden you have inflammation in an area that can't process it as quickly or as efficiently. So let me ask you something then. If you have lymph nodes removed from both sides, where do you get your blood drawn? Oh, that's a great question. In the ideal world, in the leg. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So certainly you know, there are individuals who have lymph nodes taken from both sides. But if both sides were positive, it's a challenge for sure. But like I said, ideally leg, but the ideal situation is not always reality. So you'll have to pick the lesser of two evils. Right. So if you're going like a side by side comparison, I would say the next comparison is which side had more lymph nodes taken or which side had radiation. Because radiation is a huge impact on lymphedema as well, because radiation is coming in to get your cancer, but you have these little lymphatic collectors in there mm -hmm. and radiation doesn't know the difference between that and your cancer. So if you have a port, that's where I have a lot of blood drawn because I have mm -hmm. this rare anemia and because I'm so lucky. If you have a port, is that because that's in the quadrant of where one of my lymph nodes was removed, mm -hmm. that affected? You know, it just is something to look out for. Okay. So for the most part, people I've seen who have had ports, things go pretty well. I have seen people whose ports all of a sudden become red and a little puffy. And that's okay. something you should get checked because okay. you're always on the lookout for infection. And the first sign or the easiest sign to look out for is that red, hot, kind of uncomfortable, possibly swollen situation. And if you can avoid an infection, you can add to your prevention. Sure. For sure. Luckily, I've had no problems with my port. I've actually been oh, a lucky one. I've had no infections and I get it out in August. So pretty excited oh, about that. Exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you get into this lymphedema therapy? Oh, so when you go to physical therapy school, so when you're even applying, actually, they request that you volunteer in multiple physical therapy settings for a certain quantity of hours just to make sure you like it because it's a big commitment for something you don't like. And I did a bulk of my hours actually with a therapist who treated lymphedema and I found it incredibly interesting. It was always in the back of my mind, but you know, when you learn new things, you get distracted by other things that piqued your interest before. In PT school, everything is new, just like lymphedema is new for right. everyone who's undergoing breast cancer treatment. So I kind of forgot about it and I practiced in other areas for a while. And then I remembered and I was like, oh, maybe I'll pursue that again. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you did, too, because I actually have spoken to quite a few people about lymphedema and I'm not finished. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this podcast is because I just think that there are far too many people who don't even know what it is and what to look for. You talked about some of the signs of lymphedema and also prevention. What are some more 
prevention ideas. I learned that I can't sit in my hot tub except for up to my belly button. And then another thing is I never got those sleeves that you gave me. Like I didn't get any in New Orleans. And I figured that if it's such a big deal, that should be something that's given to all patients that have breast cancer that have had lymph nodes removed. So what are some other prevention ideas that I'm not excited about? Because <laughs> there's a couple in there that are very important to me and I want to know how to get around it. But <laughs> so what yeah. are some <laughs> Yes. So like, did yeah, you do usually would... in your classes, see people go, what? I, I can't lift weights anymore. Or... <laughs> it's so true. It is. I dislike, I don't think I know very many people who enjoy being the bearer of bad news, but so officially for prevention, just like you said, heat is a huge, what is it? The, it brings so much more fluid to an area. So even if you just think about your body in summertime, if you ever wear rings or anything like that, it usually gets tight, right? Yes. And it's just because your body is bringing your blood superficially to cool it. So that would be fine. In a normal area, that's totally fine. More fluid, more blood flow in an area, whatever. The problem is you're bringing more blood to an area that then needs to filter more fluid from it. And that's why it's risky. So hot tubs, yes. It's a not as popular piece of education that yeah. we're talking about but officially best practice is going to be to submerge to the belly button and it's because of that quadrant below the belly button it's going to drain down into the inguinal nodes do i have people that want to push those limits and mm -hmm. like well Catherine's not going to be there so i'm going to submerge all the way <laughs> you can <laughs> and i won't <laughs> and i get people who test it and you know what I can't blame you because why else would you undergo breast cancer treatment if you didn't want to survive and enjoy your life? But yeah, I'll give you the official recommendations and we'll chat about yeah. how people try to go around it. So that being said, bathtubs too. So your frequent bathers in the bathtub, same rule applies. Saunas. Saunas is a big downer for people too. And yeah. again, it's that heat component. It's just so much superficial flow and you don't want to risk it. I don't want anyone to risk it, but it's just everywhere and you're just increasing that lymphatic load. And those lymphatics are not operating in a capacity like before. You'll be happy to know that I did sit in the hot tub up to my belly button last <laughs> night. <laughs> there is a part that I found in the hot tub that I'm like, okay, Catherine is going to be so happy that I told her that. That I had sat to my belly button. Um, yeah. Would I rather be sitting down and getting that massage? Yes. That's Absolutely. why I bought it. It was really good for therapy. So that was a real bummer for me. But is there a certain temperature that you can turn it down to or anything that, or is it just any warmth of whatever? Like in the summertime, if you turned it down to 98 or I don't know, I don't even know if that would even make a difference. Is that still yeah. too hot? It's still pretty yeah. hot. I don't yeah. know that I know the certain temperature ratings, like where exactly is it 93 yeah. degrees or 91.5? I'm not entirely sure okay. on that. Let's say you're five years out and you are at a party or you're on vacation, you forget and you submerge all the way. You forget all your precautions because you're having such a great time and you're loving <laughs> surviving, right? One time in isolation, should be okay if you're monitoring your body. So if you're checking your body's response to this added uh, fluid accumulation. So again, checking your hands is probably not the best comparison, but if you must, check both because you want to see how your entire body is responding. And that way you can have a nice comparison. For you, it's a little more tricky, especially with both sides with lymph node removals, but check your feet. Sometimes I get people that come in, they're like, oh my gosh, I am swollen, my arm is swollen, and you need to look and we measure and it's like, oh my gosh, it is. Then we check the other side and then we check their ankles and you're like, your whole body has extra fluid on. And that's a normal. Salt has a lot to do with it too. If you eat a whole pizza the night before, water follows sodium. So salt has a big impact on it. 
the temperature of the air, pressure in atmosphere impacts it too. So a lot of people who are on chemotherapy drugs, some of those drugs cause massive quantities of fluid accumulation. So always a side-to-side comparison or just checking out other body parts is really important too. Um, so if you, so it would, so what do you do if you have all of this fluid? Like just say your arm has all this fluid or whatever. What do you do to get rid of that? Is there a certain massage? What do you do? Oh, so it depends. If if it's just your arm and if it's just in the quadrant, then I would highly encourage you to go get formal instruction by a therapist that knows how to do the manual lymphatic drainage. So if it's true lymphedema, you need to have additional steps and very specific education on how to treat your specific fluid. But if it's more of a body-wide swell, then just consider ways to remove the cause. Obviously, if you're undergoing chemotherapy, you can't do that. And I don't want you to. So just watch it. A lot of times, to your point earlier, a sleeve is a great method of facilitating fluid movement away from an arm. So sleeves... Is a, compression is a whole topic in itself, but okay. for our intents, the compression sleeves that are great for prevention are usually a lower pressure. So the same pressures that are the same units that are taken with blood pressure, it's in millimeters of mercury, and that's the force on your body. And so when people are taking your blood pressures, they're, especially if it's done by a machine, is pumping your arm up to what, like 200 millimeters of mercury. So the compression sleeves that we use for prevention are actually pretty low, usually around 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So when we're talking about preventative sleeves, we're talking those lower pressures, but just enough to facilitate fluid movement out of the arm. And what's important about compression sleeves, (laughs) which you got me on a tangent, but I'm just going to roll with it. (laughs) And it's medical grade compression is a little more expensive. And the reason is, well, for one, it's a medical piece of equipment, so everything's more expensive. But of course. a medical grade, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's graduated. So fluid moves from the areas of high pressure to low pressure. And so that's what medical grade sleeves do, is the pressure is higher down at the wrist and it's lower up at the axilla. So you're getting that movement up and out. And that's why the sleeves are so important. It is also really important sizing. If I could size everyone, I could. But a good quality sleeve, you should have measurement comparisons at the upper arm, the elbow, and the wrist at least. I think I, I'll have to send you if I haven't already, but links to websites that have good compression sleeves. Good, yes. Because I do want to let the audience know that in the show notes, there are some resources there. So we can add that as well. You told me about Lymphadiva. Yeah. There are some super cute ones on there. And you gave me some sleeves. And I will tell you, I probably should have been wearing it yesterday. I drove quite a bit yesterday and my arm was getting really tired. So I probably should have been wearing that. But I have worn it on the golf course. (laughs) Perfect. And it's not uncomfortable. And I need to keep my skin out of the sun anyway from a, a med I'm on right now. So I wear long sleeves anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I just put it right under there and I was very comfortable swinging the club. And yeah, so I'm just glad that you even said anything about the sleeve. I didn't, I had no idea that I should have those. No idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just another layer of prevention. So perfect. I'm actually really proud of you. You're the (laughs) child. So yeah, during golf or if you're going to be outside gardening, especially in the summer, if you're going to do heavy weightlifting, especially, I would have you wear the sleeve for sure. And then when we talk about heavy weights, you know, heavy to one person might be light for another. But when we're talking about lymphedema prevention, I usually tell my patients that for the affected arm, try to consider keeping the weight down to maybe 25 pounds per arm. And it's just that repetition that we feel could be dangerous because as you're lifting weights and you're creating muscle mass, you're creating little pieces of inflammation. And 
that could be the cause of an increase in fluid to that area. Groceries, I think people forget a lot about groceries. So I don't know about you, but I am definitely like one trip from the car. All yes. the groceries <laughs> are coming in. Yes. Yeah. So just try to load that. That's one a arm. lot. <laughs> load it. Um, yeah. I would think that even like other exercises like running or biking, things like that, because I, when I exercise, my fingers do get swollen because I sweat and I get swollen. So I would think that wearing the sleeve during those times as well probably would be beneficial. Absolutely. And to your point, it shouldn't be uncomfortable. If the sleeve is really uncomfortable, it might not be the right size for you. So yes, anytime you're exercising, hiking, running, biking, put it on just in case because you never know. And then from a sizing standpoint, because I think people get worried about it. If you have sewing measuring tape, that's those looser ones, Mm -hmm. not like the construction kind, just lightly go around the areas that the size chart will tell you. Every good medical grade compression will have a picture of an arm and a specific measurement points. Even if you're off by a little bit, as long as you have a general idea, you'll be just fine. Um, But actually what you were going to say or what you said earlier about driving long distance road trips, great time to wear a sleeve, especially because you're holding your arms up and that's a lot of load. Air travel is one that we always recommend a sleeve. And it's just because the thought is with higher altitude, it's lower pressure. And so everyone's body wants to hold, their cells want to hold water. And so with a sleeve, you're just moving fluid out. It's just another lovely way of prevention. Yeah. So I just think that making it as a habit, yesterday I should have been wearing it. And I, it's so funny because you said, <laughs> the earlier you said something like, well, Catherine's not here, so she doesn't <laughs> see what I'm doing. Yeah. But Catherine is in <laughs> your head. And actually you were in my head yesterday. Oh. And I was like, oh my God, I probably, and my bag was all the way back in the camper. And <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, and I'm driving. I will definitely keep that in mind. But I, you were in my head when I was in the hot tub yesterday going, <laughs> And I was holding my arms out. Good job. <laughs> this is great. So, can we just wear compression all over our body and get in the hot tub? No, just kidding. No. But also the other thing that I was really bummed about was that I have a tattoo I want to get on on my sleeve. I mean, I have tattoos on this arm already, so I wanted to add it. And you're saying that it probably would not be a good idea to do it on that arm because I had three removed. And if I am going to do it, do it on the one. But that even is probably not the greatest to do either. So I need to figure out where to put my Phoenix that I had designed for me, Catherine. And it was supposed to be in a certain position. And so the quadrant is probably not the best. Yeah, Yeah. So that's the official recommendation. (laughs) So what about nipple tattoos? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Because if you think about it too, a lot of people ask me like, wait a second, I'm going to have a reconstruction. I'm having major surgery on an area that has reduced lymphatic capacity. And it's all right. (laughs) Like I said, there are exceptions. Yes. And I would hate to endorse a full sleeve of tattoos on an infected side. (laughs) The key is just watching it and just making sure that you know your body and you know how your body responds to even mosquito bites or bee stings. There's a normal inflammatory process and then there's a reduction and you just have to watch for the reduction. And let's say you went rogue. Let's say you're like, I don't care. I'm getting the Phoenix and I'm getting where I want it. You would have to watch it. So you'd have to just make sure that everything is healing the way it should. And because just because you have a little bit of swelling in the quadrant doesn't necessarily equal true lymphedema development. You could have a flare. I've had people who have helped someone move and they forgot like, oh, that repetitive overhead lifting Mm -hmm. can often trigger a lymphedema flare or sometimes set people into lymphedema. And flares don't necessarily equal lymphedema. It's just, it's your body's way of saying, hey, you need to tone it down, like back off on whatever you're doing because I need to take care of this. 
And I think that's probably one thing people wonder and they repeatedly ask me, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What do I even do? Because it's still an enigma, right? Because we know that lymphedema is this protein-rich fluid buildup, but what does it feel like? And unfortunately, the answer is different for everybody, but I would say if you're being active and you're doing things, let's say you go for it and get that full sleeve tattoo, but then later your arm feels achy and a little heavy, sometimes that can be your body's way of saying, hey, pay a little extra attention to the side. And then pay attention to your shirt sleeves. Pay attention to your bra. Is your bra really digging into your skin on that side? Are your sleeves a little tighter? But usually it's that achy, heavy, full feeling Mm -hmm. that is new and not equal to the other side if the other side isn't affected. And that's okay. That could just be your body just saying, warning, back off. And then you'll just have to see how it goes. So I think that might be what I'm feeling. My, like I said before, my husband saw a little bit of swelling under my armpit when I was lifting my arm. Mm-hmm. And it does feel a little bit achy and tired. And I think that maybe it's because of driving yesterday for four and a half hours. I was driving a big truck. So oh. that possibly could have been, and it was feeling a little bit uncomfortable and We took some walks and things like that where, um, and it wasn't overly hot out or anything like that, but I just think that being mindful of those things and having those sleeves right there, always right there, just in case you're in a situation where you probably should be wearing them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just so glad I know that now because if it wasn't for you, I would not even know this. I would just be like, why is my armpit feeling a little bit swollen? So I'm going to be coming to see you (laughs) soon. How can we bring more awareness about lymphedema to our community and other communities? How do we do that? And I know that you're working hard to do that. What is out there that's bringing that awareness? Not enough. (laughs) That's for sure. (laughs) Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I think the lymphedema community is small, right? It's a big issue, but it's a small community. And so I think the biggest organization out there is LEARN. And yeah, the link for that should be here. I see that. That's all things lymphedema. And it's so interesting. They have the latest research on there. They have the latest bills. Big topics in lymphedema has to do with compression. So the sleeves. And the cost of it, because medical grade compression is expensive. And so LEARN has, it's a wonderful organization just for basic education too. They have, if you forget everything that I've talked about here and you're like, oh, where do I even go? LEARN is a great website for that. Unfortunately, beyond there's Lymphedema Day that's in March, but beyond that, there's- Lymphedema Day. No, that's the Lymphedema Day. Uh, there's Everything just, has a day. It does. <laughs> but unfortunately, you wouldn't know it, right? Yeah. Unless you... No, know. you would not. <laughs> and I... Unfortunately, I don't know that I have a lot of answer to that question other than if you know even just a little bit, even just from talking to people and just like you chatting with people at your clinic, at your oncologist's office, at your infusion clinic. Be like, hey, you know, you get lymph nodes out. That radiation? You, are you looking for lymphedema? Just talking to people and not being afraid to open up that conversation because you never know. Well, I'll send him this episode too. I'm just so glad that I met you so that we could do this. Yeah. So one of the topics that you and I have been talking about in the last day or whatever <clears throat> is my insurance. I wanted to come to you as my therapist because come to find out. It has everything to do with my breast cancer and it's part of the treatment. It's part of healing. It's part of recovery, all of that. So my insurance denied it because they said something to the effect of while they do have a contract with Renown, they don't have a contract with your department, but you're telling me that you do have people come to you with my insurance so for people out there, sometimes things get denied. I've been, I was denied a hospital stay because of my rare anemia, because apparently it wasn't 
life-threatening when mm-hmm. in fact, it actually was life-threatening. So I, we called, I got a letter and all that stuff and we called my insurance and they reversed that. That comes along with advocating for yourself and paying attention to what your insurance company is doing. Because I have every intention when we get off of this episode, I'm going to be calling them and finding out why it was denied. My oncologist is the one who referred me to you to be able to come to you. So I will keep you posted on that. So those people who are listening, if you have anything that's denied like that, don't take that as an answer. You've got to call them and find out why and and somehow have them reverse that, especially given that you see people with my insurance. Absolutely. And on that similar vein, whoops, there's the women's health and I always forget what it's called. And I'm a terrible therapist for not knowing this off the top of my head. <laughs> but there's a federal law and it's the women's, I, want, I always call it the Women's Health Act. I don't know that it's actually called that. But it was created in the 90s and it was to force insurances essentially to cover things like reconstruction after mastectomies. Yes. In that act, it says lymphedema related care and it's a federal law and all insurances have to cover it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. That is one of the reasons that and I know what act you're talking about. I just don't know exactly what it's called. No. And I know that it was done in the 90s. And the only reason I know that is because when I was talking to the Center for Restorative Breast Surgery, they told me that by law, insurance companies have to cover the reconstruction. Now they're trying to change the code. Mm-hmm. And so I'm on an advocacy group who are trying to get them to stop the code change because they're trying to get it so that the insurance companies only have to pay for the older version of the surgery that I had. And we're like, no, women should be able to get whatever reconstruction they want as breast cancer patients. They should be able to get whatever one they want. And it's looking really good. But that is a really good point that that same act has lymphedema prevention in there. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, you're welcome. So with that being said, I will take that to my insurance company. (laughs) Yes. And maybe that's one thing we could have a link to just so people can always reference that. I will find it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I think in theory, that act should coerce companies or insurance companies into paying for sleeves. I know that a lot of people have had challenges with that. It's an ongoing battle. There was recently, actually earlier this year, a bill was passed that had solely to do with compression. And it's so exciting for the lymphedema world, not just breast cancer, unfortunately, but like for everyone. So we're excited to see where that is going. But insurance, I feel it's such an unnecessary burden that people have this worry and So if you're armed with any sort of information to be like, actually, this would just. There are far too many people who just go, "Okay, well, it was denied and they just sort of go about their way. No, 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 no. We need to empower people to stand up for themselves, find the information or at least be taking the information that they are being given. And And we'll put that in the resources no, do not take what your insurance company says at at face value. You have to, you really have to question them. And it is really stressful, Catherine. It becomes a full-time job when you are submitting stuff. Like I have a cancer policy. I had this wherewithal 20, 15 years ago to say yes to a cancer policy through my school district. And thank goodness I did. And thank goodness I actually kept it because I retired last year and I had a deadline that I had to tell them whether I needed to, wanted to keep it or not. Luckily, I got diagnosed before that deadline. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I better keep that. Who knew I would need it? But it becomes a full-time job and it's incredibly stressful. And no one that has to go through any kind of cancer or any kind of illness should have to be so stressed out by that because it's so complex and they do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I watched a documentary a long time ago that's about insurance companies. And there were people who worked for insurance companies who said 
insurance companies train their employees to deny first. Always deny first. How scary is that? And how many people just take that and say, well, I was denied. So, you know, oh, well. Or not be just, oh, well, but really upset about it and have to pay all this money. So, no, I'm really very much into advocating for yourself and using your resources as much as you can to find out more. So thank you for bringing that up. And we will find that and we will add that. And Mm -hmm. I will take that to my insurance. (laughs) Absolutely. So how can people reach you? If they have questions or want to come to a class or want to have you as their therapist in our area, how can they reach you? If you're in the Reno area and I work for the big organization here, so you're welcome to have any of your doctors refer to lymphedema therapy. I do teach a monthly class on lymphedema prevention and we hand out sleeves there courtesy of Moms on the Run. and. Yeah. And it's a free class. Anyone can go. It can be virtual. It can be in person. I think we'll have a link to that RSVP site here. If you had a quick question, you wanted to call the office, we'll have the phone number here too. And then I was thinking about it and I had an email that I'll check maybe like on a weekly basis. Sometimes during the week, I get a little overloaded with my current patient caseload, but For questions, if you're not in the area or if you live in an area that doesn't maybe have a lymphedema therapist, I'm happy to check that email with questions that anyone might have. Oh, okay. You might have to bear with me on the timing of that because I I have to make time to make sure I can look at it. Right. So I haven't forgotten. I just need a little extra time. And so that's it. I'll send that link to you as well. Well, thank you for offering that. I really appreciate that. And I know how busy you are. And I am just so grateful for the service that you are providing. It is so much more important than I had ever even expected or knew. Or, And I'm hoping that people who have never even heard of lymphedema, or maybe they've heard about the word or whatever, mm-hmm. that they've gotten so much more from you. You've provided such a great wealth of knowledge. And I just thank you. Very much. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? (laughs) What should I add? There are so many things. Um, I know. I know. (laughs) I'm just glad that people can reach out and and that we have those resources too. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I would say podcast here is scratching the surface. Like if I had the opportunity, I could probably talk for hours about it. I would say a few things. First is you're not doomed for a basketball sized breast or like a huge Hulk arm. That's not the way it will work. <laughs> and and if you do wake up like that, actually, that's an emergency. You should go yeah. for the room. That's not lymphedema. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say the risk is always present and is always going to be present. It is not something that you have to watch for five years and you're like, okay, never mind. Because you your body can't regenerate lymph nodes but it can regenerate the lymphatic collectors. So similar to when people exercise, you can make more blood vessels. You can have a stronger, bigger heart, right? So with lymphatics, if you're moving your arm and you're stretching and you're doing active things through full range of motion, you can create more connections to pull that fluid. And so there's a thought that with time, you can increase your capacity, which is so cool. So I would say keep moving, but always just listen to your body and it will tell you if you've done too much and just kind of look out for it. And if you think, if you get worried, just reach out. (laughs) Yeah. I really like that whole idea of listening to your body. I've been always very good at listening to my body. So even yesterday I was like, okay, I need to talk to Catherine because I have some heaviness and I remember you telling me about that and I know that something is up. So I'll have to figure that out. We can certainly do another episode with you later down the road if you want to chat about how we can do that. So this does not have to be our one and only episode. (laughs) Okay. Well, thank you so much. I, again, really thank you for being here and I thank my audience. And again, if you want to reach Catherine, 
We will have her phone number and email address in the show notes and then some amazing resources to find out more. And just as a reminder, don't Google. (laughs) Especially the images. Especially the images, yes. And, (laughs) And we will see you all next time on the next episode of Test Those Breasts. Great. Thank you. Thank you.